Good morning and hello everyone. Good morning. And, and welcome morning. to the roundtable organized by Kai DP from Seoul, Korea, and Fab Fostering Art and Design from Barcelona, Spain, through his material center, Mater Fad. First of all, I would like to inform you that the session is recorded with the agreement of the organizers, speakers, and moderator. Throughout the entire session, please keep close your microphones and turn off your video camera. Thank you very much. I am Valérie Bergeron, director of MatterFAD and deputy director of FAD. If we are together today is due to an agreement between KIDP and FAD to bring to Korea the new the Neo Materia exhibition as part of the Green New Deal policy that promotes the eco-friendly transformation of industrial systems. FAD, Fostering Art and Design, based in Barcelona, is a non-profit association of professionals and businesses connected to design since 19. And three, that believes that design can improve the lives of people. KIDP, Korea Institute of Design Promotion, is the only design body in Korea to plan and implement national design policies and strategies. Neomateria, New Materials for Design and Craft, is a material exhibition co-curated with Ivan Rodriguez, New Materials expert, for the Consortium of Commerce, Crafts, and Fashion of Catalonia. Since the dawn of time, design and craftsmanship have accompanied humanity, supporting and reflecting the evolution of societies. However, the changes that have taken place in recent decades have been faster and more profound than at any time in history. There is no doubt a new geological era marked by substantial impact of humans on their environment obliges us to a maximum creativity for strategic application of materials. In this context, the link between design and society is undergoing a new transformation a revolution in which matter is reformulated and opened the door to a new way of creating. This, is exhibi this exhibition seeks to give a voice to some of the materials called by us neo materials that represent this change and seeks to highlight the vital role of the designer maker as creator and transformer of neo matter. Today, the first of three round tables that will take place before the end of the year proposes an open conversation between designers from uh, Korea and Spain. So it's a pleasure to welcome them and to introduce Robert Thompson, scientific director of Mater Fad, who will conduct the session as the moderator of the round table. I hope you will enjoy the session Thank you in behalf of KDP and of FAD. Thank you very much, Valerie, for the wonderful introduction. I want to welcome you all to the session. I hope this session will provide you with some interesting ideas regarding new materials, new applications, new designs, and new futures. So here with us today, we have two designers, uh, well-renowned, in specific areas of design and, and thought. On the one hand, we have Silvana Katazin. She is a European designer. Uh, she's the co-founder and creative director of Nye Factory Lab. This is a company that is based in Europe. One of the aspects uh, of their creations and of her creations are the use of uh, resins uh, with waste products, more specifically the use of olive uh, pits, which are the seeds of the olive, which is a very hard material. And these have found their way into interesting new applications. On the other hand, we also have uh, Kim Hyunju. She is a Korean-based designer. She's a product designer. 
Uh, she received in 2008 a uh, Red Dot Award, prestigious award for uh, concept thinking and design. In 2009, she started her design studio located in Seoul, uh, launching in 2015 Plus Nature, which is a product concept, uh, accessories for the home, for instance, that are based on biological and biophilia. So today here, we'll give you a brief introduction uh, on resins and their properties, uh, and then we will proceed uh, on interviewing our designers regarding their projects and regarding uh, the processes that they've used uh, that, to come up with new designs and applications. So what is a resin? A resin is a very old and very specific type of material class. Often when we talk about resins, we are talking about one component of another more complex and composite type of material. And I say composite because usually resins form part of a composite. This implies that resins are a type of material which functions as an agglutination uh, component. This means that it can take other elements uh, which can be very diverse. In fact, it could be particles, these could be uh, fibers, these could be aggregates made from minerals, made from natural materials or synthetic materials. And resins have this wonderful ability uh, to bring these aggregates together and hold them into place. And so as a result of this process, we get a composite material which has properties of both, but the properties of both is actually elevated to more than the sum of those properties. So we have a sort of a synergy. And uh, essentially to understand this in a better uh, envelope of cognitive association, we can say that resins are a binding agent. This is a typical word used in material science. And of course, there are many different types of binding agents. So on the one side, we have, for example, uh, synthetic uh, types of polymers. These range in different uh, types. For example, more common versions are the polyesters. There's polyester resins, which is a synthetic polymer. We also have epoxy-based resins. These tend to be a little stronger than polyester and a little more dense. But there are other types of resins as well. Um, we're talking initially about rigid types of resin, but there are also more flexible types of resin. These, these are the polymer or the rubber polymer resins. Typicals are the polyurethanes um, and also natural rubbers like latex or caucho, which comes from the natural caucho tree. But today we'll be centering more on a later trend of these materials, a trend which is based on the idea that resins typically are very difficult to recycle and they often do not biodegrade. And so the recent movement in development of resins has been more centered towards the development and applications and innovations of biologically based or biopolymers or bio resins. And these can be very, very diverse as well. For instance, sugar can constitute a bio resin because sugar is a crystal and we can melt that crystal and we can solidify that crystal into a resin. But there are other more sophisticated versions of these bioresins that we are applying today. For example, corn-based bioresins, also that come from the protein known as zine. This is often cultivated in agriculture, especially corn or wheat or barley. There are also other types of more sophisticated resins that are being developed today through the use of the integration of different types of scientific techniques, especially chemistry and thermochemistry and biochemistry. And these constitute uh, resins which are based on proteins. So today we, we find that on the market there are also protein-based bioresins and there are also collagen-based bioresins. So this is a brief introduction about resins and their functions within the material 
uh, say, realm. But the focus is not on this today. The focus is on examining the very diverse and interesting ideas that inventors and designers are currently using resins today. And so I would like to now migrate perhaps more into the interview section. And uh, I would like to perhaps start with you, Silvana. Um, I'm astonished at the level of complexity and the level of detail which you were able to achieve in some of your products. I'm wondering if you could briefly tell us a little bit about yourself, perhaps a little bit about the materials that you're uh, coadjuvating into these new shapes and new functions, and perhaps talk a little bit also about your process. Okay, uh, thank you very much. I'm very proud to be here. And uh, I'm Silvana Catazzini. I'm a multidisciplinary designer. I work with, uh, I do objects, um, I do art installations, uh, ephemeral architecture. And I started to work with biomaterials to apply my work. You know? And uh, I only was born when I was uh, in the, dur during a summer course in Barcelona called um, Biomater um, Biomaterials, no, Sustainable Materials to uh, Applying Design. No? And um, I was uh, lunch nearby the school. And I need to find uh, uh, ways to start to work. And uh, when I look at my, when I was lunch, you know, when I look at my dish, when I finish, I look at my dish and I saw the olive pits look at me, you no? Know? And I thought, mm, maybe I can do something like this. And uh, I taught them, I showed to my teacher. My teacher was uh, Robert, you know? And I, I asked, and I asked her, hey, Hobbit, what do you think I can do something with this? You know? And he said, yes, of course, let's try. You know? uh, this is the short story. Uh, I uh, invited my partner to continue the research with me. You know? mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, so I was doing some other uh, jobs, different things. And then she came with this idea, crazy idea. At, at the beginning, it was like, wow, I've never worked with anything like this. No, I'm an architect, in, uh, but I, I used to work with materials developed by, by someone else. So it was the first chance for me to start to do our own material. But then I saw what, what she got to during this course. And I, I, I was really surprised. So we started to, okay, I decided to enter in the, in the project. And then we started to uh, research a little bit more about this waste. So we got to this incredible information about uh, olive uh, peeps because they are, of course, Spain is the main producer of, of uh, olive oil. So we have a lot of waste uh, in, in, in peeps. And then we we uh, we started to ask to the to the uh, to the olive oil uh, industry, and they said that they mainly they have no use for these bones for these uh, peeps. The most of the times they burn it, or sometimes they 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 sell it also to cosmetics as a as an additive. But it's a, a little. A tiny part of the 27,000 tons of olive peeps that we produce each year. So we had a lot of ways to work with. Then oh, we. That's, oh, that's fascinating. That's fascinating. Yes, aspect. yes sure. Uh, and in fact, uh, what we got this first material that was worked with those olive bones that she found in this in, the, in her dish. Then we, we, we needed more uh, quantity, you know, and also pro processed uh, olive bones uh, because uh, to work with, you need to break it and, and, and to get this, this uh, different textures. And it's not easy to break it, it's quite hard. So we found an industry that they take the olive bones from the olive industry and they, and they micronized, I don't know if you say it like this, so we can get almost dust uh, from these olive bones. 
And uh, so we had this new material with us and we started to experiment with it with different kinds of resins. And we got to different formulas uh, and different materials, really interesting because uh, they were quite hard and quite beautiful. And so we started parallelly to this uh, creation of the material, we started to apply it in different products because as designers and, and, and artisans that we are, we, we can't help to, to, to do things with, with the material that we get that in, in our hands. So now we had our own material and we started to do things with it, you know, create pieces and just like, like artisans do, like we did before with ceramics and, and vegetal fibers and so on. And well, these first pieces that we create, we started to show them in, in some events and fairs. And we saw that there was a quite big interest on, in public about this new uh, line of, of our work. So we decided to focus on, on this uh, 100%. And this is when we enter in, 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 a, in a project here in Barcelona in the Fab Lab. And they helped us a lot with, uh, with uh, mentoring and, and the possibility to use some other technologies like CNC cutting or laser cutting or uh, I think, uh, 3D printing and so on. So we we started to create pieces uh, with with another uh, with a wide range of possibilities. You know, we could we could uh, cut and and uh, we could also get some information about other uh, additives that we we could add to the formula in order to in order to get different kinds of uh, properties to the material uh, and this is more or less the period when we started to experiment also with natural pigments like uh, like turmeric or wood louse and and it was really nice to see also that we could change the color just with, with things that we could find in, in our uh, normal stores or even here in the mountains where we got some, some uh, natural pigments, local natural pigments. And uh, well, some of the images that you see are, um, were created during this period. You know? uh, for example, this image is, is a, the inspiration was this leaf that you got uh, on the left part of the image gave us the idea of creating this other, uh, this element with our material. This we make to the children is a toy uh -huh. to, because I think it's very important to start to see the world with another eyes, no? To see the, 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 the possibility of the waste to, to convert in materials to work. So, uh, but we need to be, a lot of designers doing this. Mm -hmm. no? Absolutely, yeah. I think it's it's always a wonderful thing, first of all, to see kind of how the initial steps of a project are, are actually born, you know, from an observation and to watch them grow and to become actual reality. It truly is a, a beautiful material. And, uh, you know, it has this very warm tone to it. It's very calming. Uh, effect, uh, you know, I, I I see I see potential applications. Now, maybe you can uh, perhaps give us some ideas on these applications. But the initial applications, Josian, that I first uh, imagined is, of course, you're an architect. So materials of this type, I'm wondering if they have, you know, some kind of extra property, like maybe thermal or structural or perhaps textural. Uh, or maybe even the ability to welcome other life forms. Uh, I'm wondering if you could go into some of your ideas of how this material could be applied and what sectors and, and why. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, well, since we started to communicate the results, we got a lot of feedback from different uh, sectors, you know, like from furniture to cosmetics or to olive oil, uh, and so on. So we are like trying to focus ourselves in, in one thing to start and start to build our business about this material. But as long as we see it, it is possible to be applied in uh, quite a lot of things like 
from furniture, in fact, that's one of the things that we're starting with because there's an enterprise here in Barcelona very interested in developing a new line of uh, furniture with this material. So we started the project together. But also, uh, we see that if we, uh, if we can create like um, big panels of this material, we can, we can uh, use it for construction, for example, or uh, ephemeral architecture. That was one of the things that we started uh, that we wanted to work with because it was our main job. We, we, we started uh, in design with architecture for uh, stands and fairs and events and so on. And we saw a lot of uh, things that were thrown off after the event. So we saw every, every work we did, we saw how many things were thrown to the trash. So we wanted to create something that we could work with. And if we throw it to the trash, it is biodegradable, so it's, it's no problem for the planet. So this is one of the things that we would like to work with also. That's and, great, it's fantastic. I'm wondering if you could, uh, or if, if, this, if this is something you can talk about, wondering if you, you've experimented with different types of binding resins, as I take it, perhaps, if you could uh, tell us a little bit about that. Mm -hmm. Well, one, some of the, the binders that we've used, that we, uh, we create formulas, were pine resin, which is interesting because in Spain we got uh, plenty of pine, so we can work with, with this uh, resin, uh, you know, local resin in, in some terms. Uh, also, we used a collagen resin, and we also used agar. So we tried with, with these three kinds of uh, resins. We also tried with a uh, corn, with corn starch, corn starch, and with tapioca starch. Uh, but does it work? And also with alginato, alginate, 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 alginate. Mm -hmm. also. But uh, for us, uh, these three. Uh, See, these first three are the, the the best for for. I mean, the, the best materials we got to were with these three. Uh, also, we have to add some other additives to to go to the final formula, but those three work quite good with with olive pips. Uh, and that's one that's one thing interesting that I wanted to also to talk about this material is the fact that we can uh, we can melt it if we don't like it, or we get, for example, if we do a toy for children, and you know that children grow. And they, there's a point where they don't want to play anymore with this toy. So most of the toys were done with plastic. So these toys become uh, garbage just in a second, no? But if, if it's done with this material, we can also throw it to the nature because it's biodegradable, but we also can melt it and put it in a new mold and create another, uh, another toy for these children or another object. So it's, it's is not only biodegradable, but it's reusable. So we can give him, give this object few uh, other lives after this original use. Can I ask a question? Uh oh. Please. It seems that we lost the connection with Robert, maybe, uh -huh. or we yeah. don't see him. But please, Yonju, ask your question and, <laughs> and present your project. Thank you. First, uh, Silvana and Jose, and it's a beautiful project, and I love the material you created. Uh, but I wonder how strong they are. Uh, it has a water resistant or the heat temperature, and is it easy mm -hmm. to break or just I mm -hmm. wonder? Yeah, uh, well, in terms of resistance, uh, um, mechanical resistance, it is quite strong. Really, it's really strong. I mean, also in, for impact and for uh, flexion and compression, it, it works very nice. Um, it's not- The, the wood, the more- the, Yeah, the brown, the brown material. The one, not the, uh, the transparent is, is well, is, 
it's not that thick so it's more like a bioplastic mm -hmm. but the brown one is really strong and that's the one what that we are uh, that we are using for furniture and also for making panels but for in contact with water it is quite resistant but it is not resistant for a uh, long use in contact with water i mean if I if I uh, if it gets wet with the rain, for example, it won't uh, melt down. But if you put it under the uh, if you put it in the water for a long time, it will uh, decompose little by little. So that's what it makes uh, biodegradable in, in a fast period, like in three weeks or four weeks. It uh, in contact with water, it, it will disappear. But we are, uh, we are, we still research, you know, to find the, to put the others um, additives, additives yeah. or so, coatings. I mean, yeah. depending on the use that we want to do with it, or the uh, the client, for example, if, if there's an enterprise that wants to use this in contact with water, we are uh, planning to use some kind of, of natural co uh, coatings also to, to protect to, to protect the material. Mm. I really, I really love the designs, the kind of nature based, especially in this image that we're seeing here, that really kind of brings me to some other aspect that I would like to perhaps invite Kim to, uh, to share some of her inputs on, on her projects and her designs. I, I, I was looking at your website uh, yesterday and I was appreciating all the shapes and the nature, the, the biophilia, nature based designs and shapes. I'm wondering if you could um, elaborate a little bit on your use of this shellac resin, uh, which is actually a, quite a traditional kind of resin, which uh, was historically used uh, in the furniture industry. But I'm interested to see what you uh, what you have to say, Kim. Mm -hmm. Okay. Hey. Hi. I'm Hyunju, and um, industry designer based in Korea. So, well. Um, my project, uh, which is on this video, is a flex of a hanji tray uh, made of a Korean traditional paper. Hanji means Korean traditional paper in Korean. And then finish it with a shellac, so which makes it water resistant and reusable. So my project, I always um, uh, got inspiration from the nature. I don't know why, but <laughs> since I was little, when I feel upset or blue, I'll, I feel I, I get happier when I see mountain and beautiful blue sky. I think that um, we are part of nature, you know, human also part of mother nature. So it's very natural to feeling that way. And also when I finished my study in the university, I wanted us to start my studio and make my own product. First project I made with a resin, but not natural one, chemical resin. And, and it was just a prototype and I was thinking to produce that furniture, but the cost was a lot. So, you know, just a start a company cannot afford the amount of cost. To, so, you know, there are so many designer maker who is making their own product after studying product design. In the case, uh, we cannot just uh, jump into their industry with plastic or other materials. We are not appreciate about that, but also it costs a lot. So we can see lots of designers are working with the ceramic or maybe stones or paper metal or other natural materials. Um, that is one point that I was uh, working, I've been working with the natural material. Another reason is I just love nature and the shapes and the feelings. So when I started with the Hanji, the Korean paper, um, I wanted to try something that is not used to made with the material because it's a paper, so there are many lightings and it has been used for flooring material or stationary, uh, maybe a um, decorative object, but plate is a plate or tray 
a totally different approach because uh, each paper is not water resistant. Of course, we can use a, a plastic coating on the surface, which makes them waterproof, but I didn't, I didn't want to use that plastic material. Um, so first I started with Uchi. It's uh, similar with shellac, but it's different. The Korean traditional shellac is um, more European style. Actually, I didn't know when I started uh, to make my product 2013. And it, it, you, I think you can see those brown papers behind of me. They are lacquered with uh, Uchi, Korean traditional natural lacquer material. And the problem is uh, the more I use them, the more darker. So I wanted to make a greenery or maybe a lead bright color of my leaf trays, but I couldn't do that. But suddenly I got a phone call. Actually, I was on the Korean television about uh, introducing my product. And the guy who's supplying Shella, he called me the following day and he introduced about the material. So <laughs> since then, you know, I love material, but I'm not very good at it. I don't have much information. So he sent me a sample and, and gave me all certification or characteristic. So I thought it's really nice material. It's, uh, you know, um, the material from insect in India, that area. And it's been used for a long time for coating violin, but also it's using for food ingredient. So such as child little gum or aspirin. If you look at the uh, tablet, you can see they are shiny because it was coated with shella. So, mm. so actually, you know, we can eat that material. And, but we shouldn't because they get, if you drink that, it's getting harder and it will block your throat. So <laughs> they're not a good way, so never try that way. But to, if I didn't make a food tray, trays for food, I, ha I could have other options, but I wanted to use a food safety materials. So I studied about the material and started. And the problem is the shellac is blown over with the heat and alcohol. So actually if you pour um, alcohol on the surface, it will be melted. So, uh, which makes it easy, short biodegradable time, but not very strong. So, when well, I ask you to Silvana and Jose and Alir how strong uh, their product, because I have similar problem. Uh, so, when this uh, shellac coated material, we can wash them, but we cannot use a dishwasher. No, we cannot put them in a water for a long time. Otherwise, uh, um, it will be wet eventually. But it's a biomaterial. I think uh, there are pros and cons. So uh, the other character listing of my paper tray, they are flat, actually, in the packaging. They are flat like this but has an aluminum structure inside uh, so we can make it a shape. So this is a shaped one and they are flexible. So, so flat and flat, uh, flat, but you can make a three dimensional object. Uh, by working with the traditional material, I wanted to give some fun to people who use it. Because uh, when we're thinking about traditional, I'm not just thinking about oh, antique or oh, just keeping that style, master craftsmanship. But for me, the tradition is alive and it has to be continued. Otherwise, it will disappear. And um, the future, like 100 years later, people will not remember about that material and tradition. So that's uh, what Hanji trays are. That's very true. Uh, I find it interesting, the, the idea of the productization, like how you worked in the idea of having, you know, a metal structure on the inside so that you have multiple positions and perhaps even packaging issues of this, of, of this type. 
Um, you know, whenever we use biological materials, uh, we have to work within specific limits because what makes biomaterials so amazing is the fact that they do biodegrade and they are subject to water sometimes or alcohol or heat. But, but I find it interesting though that a lot of these problems can also constitute opportunities. And I'm wondering, uh, perhaps, you know, I'm asking Silvana, maybe, maybe some way that you, you guys could integrate your materials, you know, like perhaps olive particles could uh, increase the heat resistance of the resins or perhaps even the use of shellac as a binding agent could be used with olives um, as a glue of some kind. I'm wondering if you have any, if you, any one of you has any ideas in that regard. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was wondering when I, when I heard you explaining your project, which I find amazing. <laughs> Congratulations. Congratulations. Uh, especially when you talk about your, uh, your connection with nature is something that uh, we also feel Mm -hmm. and, I, and I guess that's what brings us to this to 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 work within this universe you know, of biomaterials and and nature inspiration. You but respect you respect the, the nature, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. yeah. And uh, I was asking myself what uh, with this paper, you use the shellac as a coating for the paper, or you introduce the shellac in the in the in the paper uh, formula? Uh, finishing material. I use shellac for finishing material. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I use uh, just a pure hanji, but there are two layers because I put aluminum vein structure inside. So when I glued them, I did use a potato glue. So like mm -hmm. a potato starch, uh -huh. yeah, glue them. And then just uh, applying shellac with, uh, it's very easy because shellac is some, some people find it difficult because it's very hard material. And, but I can buy shellac, it is um, made in liquid. It, when you use shellac, you have to mix with the uh, alcohol and then applying on the material, but I can get the material easily from my supplier. So for me, it was easy, but mm -hmm. I found some people it's a difficult for them. Uh -huh. Well, so, certainly, and... there are, certainly there are some aspects that you know, both of you could consider, uh, which is um, there are some other natural materials that are available that are actually not that costly that can alter some of the thermal properties of of, of resins in general. So, you know, these are normally they're considered uh, clays. So when you ap apply like these particles of clay, you can, the clay has this really good way of absorbing excess heat. And that takes away the heat from the material that's binding the clay. So that could be one aspect that the, both of you examine, especially in architectural uh, applications. And it wouldn't necessarily interfere with the properties. Now, where do you see, I'm, I'm very interested, I'm very pleased actually that both of you have such sensitivities towards you know, the need to have a better future in terms of our choices of materials and what we do and how we conceive products. I'm wondering if any one of you has any ideas about what you think the future it will look like or what it should look like. This is tough one. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah. um, I think um, we will go for more biodegradable material. I think I went um, at uh, Eindhoven last year, and I think it's October Dutch Design Week, and the theme was sustainability. And I've been working around the many places which showing uh, new materials. It was very, very fascinating. There are so many materials made of um, where vegetables like apples or made of coffee powder, also made of, uh, how can I say more, you know, like mushrooms. Um, sure. And th they has, um, beautiful texture and very interesting and biodegradable as well. But the 
problem that we cannot, I cannot use the material now, is still developing and has a certain kinds of a problem that we can use in daily life, like a water resistant problem or uh, durations and the cost as well. But you know, there are so many people, uh, so many good people are uh, inventing new materials and um, we are also aware of all those materials like a male material exhibition or other exhibition. So maybe 20 years later, we could find a new biomaterials and it can replace the total plastic pro product, I guess. Interesting. What I see for myself is that we have like two lines of work to get to, to the future that we would like to have, which I don't know which is what it is, but what I know is that if, if we work only in biomaterials, developing biomaterials, but it we don't work or we don't care about how we use them or how we use the rest of things that we have now, like plastics and, and metals and so on, probably we will, we will have problems on the, on the future. I mean, we have to change both things, materials and also the use that we do. You know? We have to change how we consume uh, because plastic, uh, I think that will never disappear. Plastic has to be used the way that it's better for, for this material and for us. But uh, if, if uh, that's the problem with plastic, if we don't change the way we use plastic, probably we will never get to a healthy pr a planet because uh, the, the time it will take to substitute plastic with other materials, uh, it can take a hundred years. So, yes, it's very so true. That's what, that's what I see. But I, I find think, it interesting. yeah. Go yeah, ahead. sorry, Robert. I think, um, uh, yeah, that's a very good point. And people are very slow, but they are trying to be changed. For example, uh, since I was working with a paper material, then I got so many questions at the trade fair. They say, is this biodegradable or disposable paper plate? So it was, a, my product was the usable one. So, and then I thought, wow, so many disposable paper plate has plastic coating on the surface and it's just a one-time use and it takes like a hundred years uh, to be biodegraded. So the next project I started uh, uh, was a biodegradable paper plate. It's actually it's a single use product, but um, uh, only paper purple is the material. I didn't put any plastic coating on the surface, but mm -hmm. it has high density. So we can use them like a normal paper cup with films on it. But, and then I got a um, project with a big hotel chain in here, South Korea. And they asked me whether I can make a biodegradable amenity kit. You know, actually there are so many hotels and they giving small amenity kit in a plastic bottles and they changing it every day, every day. We don't travel nowadays because of Corona. <laughs> we don't travel much now, but in the last year, if we thinking about how many amenity kit plastic bottles are consumed in one year, that's amazing. So. It could be a bit challenging for the company has to invest uh, quite uh, um, a lot of money to develop like uh, aluminum more than the big number of uh, production. Um, but they did it and it was a very good example, I think. And the Korean government also saying they are not allowed the hotels to using plastic water to giving how many ticket anymore, maybe in two years. So it's a, it's a good time changing. It's Absolutely. Especially in the world of packaging, it seems that packaging is probably one of the sectors that is most offensive because of the sheer fact that it's destined towards the use of individuals. And though 
And so you need certain specific resistances to foods. And, but also architecture is, is a huge field of CO2 production. And, uh, you know, the involvement of cements and the use of minerals. And, you know, I'm sure you, you guys are thinking about that when you're thinking about olives as well, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and especially me as an architect, I built a lot of things in, my, in the past. And, and now when I think how much pain I created to my <laughs> env the environment, you know, I have a lot of work to do to compense this pain that I created in the past. <laughs> so now I'm kind of focused on, on what can I do as an architect? And for example, like a month ago, there was an, a client asking me for me to, to do a house. And first I, I looked like, no, I don't do houses anymore. But then he said, no, but I want to do a house with uh, earth uh, uh, walls, you know? Sure. And I said, oh, that, that sounds interesting for me. And, and when you start to research about this technique, you see that it's a very old technique, like hundreds and hundreds of years. And it makes a lot of sense because you work with the material that you have in the place. You take the earth that you're gonna, that, that you're gonna, uh, you know, you're gonna dig to make the foundations and you use this earth mixed with some other things and, and, and you, you make the walls of the house. It makes a lot of sense, you know? Exactly. So I have to, I, I see that architecture has to look always forward, you know, to new materials and new solutions, but also has to look into the past and see what people did in the past because people were more sustainable in the past, not because they think that sustainability was nice because this, that was the only option. Right. So we have, to, we have to go back a little bit to this kind, this mindset. Well, I definitely see, you know, the use of biomaterials as actually making more options. So today we have this benefit, you know, uh, you know, one of the aspects, you know, Kim, that is very interesting about your projects is the use of cellulose, you know, cellulose is paper. And it is a wonderful, wonderful material. In fact, cellulose could be used also in, uh, in, in with, with the conjunction of olive pits to create kind of a, you know, a tensile element because, you know, fibers of cellulose tend to be very good in tension, but not very good in compression, which is why we can kind of, you know, switch mm -hmm. it around and, and twist it. So the interesting fact about uh, talking to designers like yourselves and innovators in the field is the ability to see how new materials can come from mixing those materials that you have been working on individually. And perhaps this is a good way to pave our way towards, uh, towards a future which is more invested on good ideas, right? And, 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 and as you were saying, like, should we? Should we do something? Should we continue to make things in the same way? What, uh, what do you think about that? Like, do you think the future should be more man-made? Do you think it should be more 3D printing? Um, both, perhaps? Um, what is your opinions on these, on these aspects? Mm -hmm. Me? <laughs> sure. Well, I think um, um, in the last 200 years after industrial revolution, so many things uh, changed, like um, the materials or so, uh, the way of living um, and also art and craft, art, craft and design. But um, now I thought we um, are back into craft era. You know, people are more um, thinking about craft than like uh, 30 years ago at the time, high tech and design mass production was very, very popular, but now people wants to have, it's, it's just my point of view, but people wants to have something special, not something is unique uh, and they are bored with uh, mass production plastic product. So I think it's a cycle we going back to, we could going back to past if we're thinking about like a hundred, a hundred of years, uh, um, even at the time we didn't have oil, we didn't have gas and no plastic, but they find a way of living. 
they and found the good natural materials for making the object for our lives. So, so in the future, um, people, I think people, it's difficult to changing and stop to using plastic in short time, but they are aware about that and will be changing, going back to the past maybe, using more natural resources and materials. 3D printing is a, a is has a different way. It's uh, not very good at it. So, <laughs> Sim, I think that uh, we can uh, change the future. No, I my motivation, my first motivation is preserve the future for my doctor. No, for our doctor, our doctor, <laughs> and. Um, uh, the the maker movement you now is growing, so we we can we act, we as designer we can uh, inspiration other designers to grow this biodegradable movement to make uh, more materials. You no, know? mm -hmm. so I, I, I see the future with uh, more biodegradable. Mm -hmm. No, then what can... I see, yeah, yeah, definitely it has to be, but what I see is that also. Uh, also, biodegradable materials and non-biodegradable is the use that we do of them. That's what I said before. But what I see is that uh, one thing that's really important in, in, the, in the future um, society is that we invest more in creativity for everybody, not just for designers, but also for normal people. And, and I think that uh, Crafts is something that can help people just as uh, gymnastics, that as uh, exercise does. No? Today, everybody does some kind of sport because it's really healthy and it's, it's like politically correct. So everybody has to do something. But I think that creativity and crafts creation should be also a part of what, it's, uh, what, what people has in their, in their lives. And, and today, we, most of people buy creativity done by some other people, creators and artists and so on. But I think that in the future, we should encourage people to create their own pieces, but not also for as a decoration piece, but also to solve uh, problems. Because you don't, you don't have to create a beautiful piece for yourself, but you can also uh, have the satisfaction to create a piece that's solving a problem for you. It do doesn't have to be beautiful. It doesn't have to be a, an incredible material, just the satisfaction of doing yourself your own uh, necessities, you know? Like 3D printing, for example, can help a lot in this way. I mean, you can, instead of going to a mall and buy a piece of a uh, machine that's broken or uh, something to, to fix uh, something that's broken in your house, you can make it your own and you, you, will, you, will, uh, you will be more sustainable and you also will be more uh, self-satisfied, uh, no? So I, I guess I imagine a future where people can solve their own problems with their own hands on, or with their own technology. You know, like Fab Lab, for example, is a, is a concept that it's, it's working in this direction, no? creating uh, production centers where you can go with your uh, pen drive and you can print something that you are needing. You don't have to buy it and, and from China or from wherever and, and ship it to Spain or to somewhere else. You can do it in your place, in your home, in your neighborhood. That's what yeah, I see. Thank you for that, uh, Josiane. I think that's interesting. Uh, it's very true what you're saying. The, the whole idea of uh, creativity is something that actually fascinates me. Um, I'm wondering, Kim, how, how do you create? How is it that you, how do you create your, your structures? Or your, do you work linearly? Do you get inspired by, by nature? What's your, what's your creative technique? You know the answer, yes. I got inspiration <laughs> from the nature. Um, but I'm not the type of person just to um, keep focusing to make developing my idea on desk, doing a little sketchy. 
it doesn't bring me good idea. So you know, I used to travel a lot and I love nature and going outside and finding, discover new things and it brings me lots of uh, ideas. And then I'm thinking, thinking and do some sketch and then use a uh, 3D programs to developing, realize my ideas. That's how I get it. Yep. Okay, so you take inspiration and then you, you try to use uh, some kind of technology to visualize perhaps, right? Mm -hmm. To uh, design yeah. the system or the, what it looks like, maybe the proportions. And I'm wondering uh, if both of you have a materials-based approach towards design or is it more you apply the material to a design later? So which one do you actually use? Do you, do you get inspired by a material or is it, is it that you apply a material onto an inspiration? I put material first to then design and try to find a, a, a good way of making and design to showing the character of the material. Interesting. I would say no, both. No? Mm. I would say sometimes it's the material that's giving the shape, the final shape. We don't know what's going to be. So we, we repeat the same uh, method and uh, the old material get, uh, gives the shape, the final shape. So it's, it's kind of, uh, it's like when you bake uh, bread or something, you don't know it's, what it's going to be like at the end, no? <laughs> Sometimes it's like this or like this, or it's more brown, it's more dark, it's more... So mm. some of the pieces are like this. Some other are, you know, you, you, we, we make a sketch and then we, we put it on the, on the computer and then we analyze it and then blah, blah, blah. So, and we go to the final and that's, that's, it's curious because this is the second, uh, the second uh, part of creating is the one that you get more like uh, disappointed with, you know, <laughs> because you want something and life, real life doesn't get you what you want, especially with, <laughs> with biomaterials, no, which are more like life, no. And when you lay, when you leave the material like, free to talk and to express his, himself, you always get like really happy with the results, you know? And so it's a combination. I, I agree. I mean, that's a, it's kind of a learning curve. We come from a society that has always been focused towards a scientific method in trying to increase our precision and our control over materials. But in reality, perhaps a, a better approach would be to to listen, to observe, and to adopt new ways, and to allow imperfection, maybe that will will bring us more harmony in the future. And I want to uh, applaud you for both of you for your for your designs and your your work and your inspiration. And uh, I want to hope the best for your products and your methods of design. And I want to thank you, of course, very much for participating in this session. It was eye opening. It was inspiring, and it was a wonderful thing to do. Thank you very, very much. And uh, Valerie, if you would like to perhaps uh, close the no, session. No, I'm, t I'm totally with you. And uh, I have to say that someone asked a question that we will send to Jung Jo, uh, because we have no more time to, to left for the session. And I thank you very much, uh, both of you, fantastic speakers. Thank you, Robert. And thank you, uh, our institution, KIDP and FAD, to give us this opportunity. So just remember that we will have two others round table. Uh, and please, uh, uh, we will inform you through our uh, canal of communication of our uh, institution. Thank you a lot. And uh, we finished now the, the session. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much. Bye. 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 It was a pleasure. Bye. Congratulations on you. See, see, see. Thank you. Thank, Thank you both. Thank you.